Chapter Thirty Seven of Dombey and Son. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Lyons. Dombey and Son by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirty Seven. More warnings than one. Florence, Edith, and Mrs. Skewton were together next day, and the carriage was waiting at the door to take them out, for Cleopatra had her galley again now, and Withers, no longer the wan, stood upright in a pigeon-breasted jacket and military trousers behind her wheelless chair at dinner-time, and butted no more. The hair of Withers was radiant with pomatum in these days of down, and he wore kid gloves and smelt of the water of Cologne. They were assembled in Cleopatra's room, the serpent of old Nile, not to mention her disrespectfully, was reposing on her sofa, sipping her morning chocolate at three o'clock in the afternoon, and Flowers the maid was fastening on her youthful cuffs and frills, and performing a kind of private coronation ceremony on her, with a peach-coloured velvet bonnet, the artificial roses in which nodded to uncommon advantage, as the palsy trifled with them like a breeze. "'I think I am a little nervous this morning, Flowers,' said Mrs. Skewton, my hand quite shakes. You were the life of the party last night, ma'am, you know, returned Flowers, and you suffer for it to-day, you see. Edith, who had beckoned Florence to the window, and was looking out, with her back turned on the toilet of her esteemed mother, suddenly withdrew from it, as if it had lightened. My darling child, cried Cleopatra languidly, you are not nervous don't tell me my dear edith that you so enviably self-possessed are beginning to be a martyr too like your unfortunately constituted mother withers someone at the door card ma'am said withers taking it towards mrs dombey i am going out she said without looking at it my dear love drawled mrs skewton how very odd to send that message without seeing the name bring it here withers dear me my love mr carker too that very sensible person i am going out repeated edith in so imperious a tone that withers going to the door imperiously informed the servant who was waiting mrs dombey is going out get along with you and shut it on him but the servant came back after a short absence and whispered to Withers again, who once more, and not very willingly, presented himself before Mrs. Dombey. "'If you please, ma'am, Mr. Carker sends his respectful compliments and begs you would spare him one minute, if you could, for business, ma'am, if you please.' "'Really, my love,' said Mrs. Skewton, in her mildest manner, for her daughter's face was threatening, "'if you would allow me to offer a word, I should recommend—' "'Show him this way,' said Edith. As Withers disappeared to execute the command, she added, frowning on her mother, "'As he comes at your recommendation, let him come to your room.' "'May I?' "'Shall I go away?' asked Florence, hurriedly. Edith nodded yes, but on her way to the door Florence met the visitor coming in, with the same disagreeable mixture of familiarity and forbearance with which he had first addressed her. He addressed her now, in his softest manner, hoped she was quite well, needed not to ask, with such looks to anticipate the answer had scarcely had the honour to know her last night she was so greatly changed and held the door open for her to pass out 
with a secret sense of power in her shrinking from him, that all the deference and politeness of his manner could not quite conceal. He then bowed himself for a moment over Mrs. Skewton's condescending hand, and lastly bowed to Edith, coldly returning his salute without looking at him, and, neither seating herself nor inviting him to be seated, she waited for him to speak. Entrenched in her pride and power, and with all the obduracy of her spirit summoned about her, still her old conviction that she and her mother had been known by this man in their worst colours, from their first acquaintance, that every degradation she had suffered in her own eyes was as plain to him as to herself, that he read her life as though it were a vile book, and fluttered the leaves before her in slight looks and tones of voice which no one else could detect, weakened and undermined her. Proudly as she opposed herself to him, with her commanding face exacting his humility, her disdainful lip repulsing him, her bosom angry at his intrusion, and the dark lashes of her eyes sullenly veiling their light, that no ray of it might shine upon him, and submissively, as he stood before her, with an entreating, injured manner, but with complete submission to her will, she knew, in her own soul, that the cases were reversed, and that the triumph and superiority were his, and that he knew it full well. "'I have presumed,' said Mr. Carker, "'to solicit an interview, and I have ventured to describe it as being one of business, because—' "'Perhaps you are charged by Mr. Dombey with some message of reproof,' said Edith. "'You possess Mr. Dombey's confidence in such an unusual degree, sir, "'that you would scarcely surprise me if that were your business.' "'I have no message to the lady who sheds a luster upon his name,' said Mr. Carker. "'But I entreat that lady on my own behalf.' to be just a very humble claimant for justice at her hands, a mere dependent of Mr. Dombey's, which is a position of humility, and to reflect upon my perfect helplessness last night, and the impossibility of my avoiding the share that was forced upon me in a very painful occasion. "'My dearest Edith,' hinted Cleopatra in a low voice, as she held her eyeglass aside. Really very charming of Mr. What's-His-Name, and full of heart. For I do, said Mr. Carker, appealing to Mrs. Skewton with a look of grateful deference. I do venture to call it a painful occasion, though merely because it was so to me, who had the misfortune to be present, so slight a difference as between the principles, between those who love each other with disinterested devotion, and would make any sacrifice of self in such a case, is nothing, as Mrs. Skewton herself expressed with so much truth and feeling last night, it is nothing. Edith could not look at him, but she said after a few moments, "'And your business, sir?' "'Edith, my pet,' said Mrs. Skewton. All this time Mr. Carker is standing. My dear Mr. Carker, take a seat, I beg. He offered no reply to the mother, but fixed his eyes on the proud daughter as though he would only be bidden by her, and was resolved to be bidden by her. Edith, in spite of herself, sat down, and slightly motioned with her hand to him to be seated too. No action could be colder, haughtier, more insolent in its air of supremacy and disrespect, but she had struggled against even that concession ineffectually, and it was wrested from her. That was enough. Mr. Cocker sat down. 
"'May I be allowed, madam?' said Carker, turning his white teeth on Mrs. Skewton like a light. "'A lady of your excellent sense and quick feeling will give me credit for good reason, I am sure, to address what I have to say to Mrs. Dombey, and to leave her to impart it to you who are her best and dearest friend, next to Mr. Dombey.' Mrs. Skewton would have retired, but Edith stopped her. Edith would have stopped him, too, and indignantly ordered him to speak openly or not at all. But that he said in a low voice, "'Miss Florence, the young lady who has just left the room.' Edith suffered him to proceed. She looked at him now, as he bent forward to be nearer with the utmost show of delicacy and respect, and with his teeth persuasively arrayed in a self-depreciating smile, she felt as if she could have struck him dead. "'Miss Florence's position,' he began, "'has been an unfortunate one. I have a difficulty in alluding to it to you.' whose attachment to her father is naturally watchful and jealous of every word that applies to him. But, as one who is devoted to Mr. Dombey in his different way, and whose life is passed in admiration of Mr. Dombey's character, may I say, without offence, to your tenderness as a wife, that Miss Florence has unhappily been neglected by her father, "'May I say by her father?' Edith replied, "'I know it.' "'You know it,' said Mr. Carker, with a great appearance of relief. "'It removes a mountain from my breast. May I hope you know how the neglect originated, in what an amiable phase of Mr. Dombey's pride. Character, I mean.' "'You may pass that by, sir,' she returned, and come the sooner to the end of what you have to say. Indeed, I am sensible, madam, replied Carker. Trust me, I am deeply sensible that Mr. Dombey can require no justification in anything to you. But kindly judge of my breast by your own, and you will forgive my interest in him, if in its excess it goes at all astray." What a stab to her proud heart to sit there face to face with him and have him tendering her false oath at the altar again and again for her acceptance and pressing it upon her like the dregs of a sickening cup she could not own her loathing of or turn away from. How shame! remorse and passion raged within her, when, upright and majestic in her beauty before him, she knew that in her spirit she was down at his feet. "'Miss Florence,' said Carker, left to the care, if one may call it care, of servants and mercenary people, in every way her inferiors, necessarily wanted some guide and compass in her younger days, and naturally, for want of them, has been indiscreet, and has in some degree forgotten her station. There was some folly about one Walter, a common lad, who is fortunately dead by now, and some very undesirable association, I regret to say, with certain coasting sailors, of anything but good repute, and a runaway old bankrupt. "'I have heard the circumstances, sir,' said Edith, flashing her disdainful glance upon him, "'and I know that you pervert them. You may not know it. I hope so.' "'Pardon me,' said Mr. Carker. "'I believe that nobody knows them so well as I. Your generous and ardent nature, madam.' The same nature, which is so nobly imperative in vindication of your beloved and honoured husband, and which has blessed him as even his merits deserve, I must respect, defer to, bow before. 
but as regards the circumstances which is indeed the business i presume to solicit your attention to i can have no doubt since in the execution of my trust as mr dombey's confidential i presume to say friend i have fully ascertained them in my execution of that trust in my deep concern which you can so well understand for everything relating to him intensified if you will for i fear i labour under your displeasure by the lower motive of desire to prove my diligence and make myself the more acceptable i have long pursued these circumstances by myself and trustworthy instruments and have innumerable and most minute proofs she raised her eyes no higher than his mouth but she saw the means of mischief vaunted in every tooth it contained pardon me madam he continued if in my perplexity i presume to take counsel with you and to consult your pleasure i think i have observed that you are greatly interested in miss florence what was there in her he had not observed and did not know humbled and yet maddened by the thought in every new presentment of it however faint she pressed her teeth upon her quivering lip to force composure on it and distinctly inclined her head in reply this interest madam so touching an evidence of everything associated with mr dombey being dear to you induces me to pause before i make him acquainted with these circumstances which as yet he does not know it so far shakes me if i may make the confession in my allegiance that on the intimation of the least desire to that effect from you i would suppress them edith raised her head quickly and starting back bent her dark glance upon him he met it with his blandest and most deferential smile and went on you say that as i describe them they are perverted i fear not i fear not but let us assume that they are the uneasiness i have for some time felt on the subject arises in this that the mere circumstance of such association often repeated on the part of miss florence however innocently and confidingly would be conclusive with mr dombey already predisposed against her and would lead him to take some step i know he has occasionally contemplated it of separation and alienation of her from his home madam bear with me and remember my intercourse with mr dombey and my knowledge of him and my reverence for him almost from childhood when i say that if he has a fault it is a lofty stubbornness rooted in that noble pride and sense of power which belongs to him and which we must all defer to which is not assailable like the obstinacy of other characters and which grows upon itself from day to day and year to year she bent her glance upon him still but look as steadfast as she would her haughty nostrils dilated and her breath came somewhat deeper and her lip would slightly curl as he described that in his patron to which they all must bow down he saw it and though his expression did not change she knew he saw it even so slight an incident as last night's he said if i might refer to it once more would serve to illustrate my meaning better than a greater one dombey and son know neither time nor place nor season but bear them all down but i rejoice in its occurrence for it has opened the way for me to approach mrs dombey with this subject to-day 
even if it has entailed upon me the penalty of her temporary displeasure. Madam, in the midst of my uneasiness and apprehension on this subject, I was summoned by Mr. Dombey to Leamington. There I saw you. There I could not help knowing what relation you would shortly occupy towards him, to his enduring happiness and yours. There I resolved to await the time of your establishment at home, here, and to do as I have now done. I have at heart no fear that I shall be wanting in my duty to Mr. Dombey if I bury what I know in your breast. For where there is but one heart and mind between two persons, as in such a marriage, one almost represents the other. I can acquit my conscience, therefore, almost equally, by confidence on such a theme in you or him. For the reasons I have mentioned I would select you. May I aspire to the distinction of believing that my confidence is accepted and that I am relieved from my responsibility? He long remembered the look she gave him. Who could see it and forget it? And the struggle that ensued within her. At last she said, I accept it, sir. You will please to consider this matter at an end, and that it goes no farther. He bowed low and rose. She rose, too, and he took leave with all humility. But Withers, meeting him on the stairs, stood amazed at the beauty of his teeth, and at his brilliant smile, and as he rode away upon his white-legged horse, the people took him for a dentist. Such was the dazzling show he made. The people took her, when she rode out in her carriage presently, for a great lady, as happy as she was rich and fine. But they had not seen her just before in her own room with no one by, and they had not heard her utterance of the three words, Oh, Florence, Florence! Mrs. Skewton, reposing on her sofa and sipping her chocolate, had heard nothing but the low word business, for which she had a mortal aversion, insomuch that she had long banished it from her vocabulary, and had gone nigh, in a charming manner, and with an immense amount of heart, to say nothing of soul, to ruin diverse milliners and others in consequence. Therefore Mrs. Skewton asked no questions, and showed no curiosity. Indeed, the peach velvet bonnet gave her sufficient occupation out of doors, for being perched on the back of her head, and the day being rather windy, it was frantic to escape from Mrs. Skewton's company, and would be coaxed into no sort of compromise. When the carriage was closed, and the wind shut out, the palsy played among the artificial roses again like an almshouse full of superannuated zephyrs, and altogether Mrs. Skewton had enough to do, and got on but indifferently. She got on no better towards night, for when Mrs. Dombey, in her dressing-room, had been dressed and waiting for her half an hour, and Mr. Dombey, in the drawing-room, had paraded himself into a state of solemn fretfulness. They were all three going out to dinner. Flowers the maid appeared with a pale face to Mrs. Dombey, saying, "'If you please, ma'am, I beg your pardon, but I can't do nothing with Mrs.' "'What do you mean?' asked Edith. "'Well, ma'am,' replied the frightened maid, "'I hardly know. She's making faces.' Edith hurried with her to her mother's room. Cleopatra was arrayed in full dress, with the diamonds, short sleeves, rouge, curls, teeth, and other juvenility all complete. But paralysis was not to be deceived, had known her for the object of its errand, 
and had struck her at her glass, where she lay like a horrible doll that had tumbled down. They took her to pieces in very shame, and put the little of her that was real on a bed. Doctors were sent for, and soon came. Powerful remedies were resorted to, opinions given that she would rally from this shock, but would not survive another, and there she lay, speechless and staring at the ceiling for days, sometimes making inarticulate sounds in answer to such questions as did she know who were present, and the like sometimes giving no reply either by sign or gesture, or in her unwinking eyes. At length she began to recover consciousness, and in some degree the power of motion, though not yet of speech. One day the use of her right hand returned, and showing it to her maid, who was in attendance on her, and appearing very uneasy in her mind, she made signs for a pencil and some paper. This the maid immediately provided, thinking she was going to make a will, or write some last request, and Mrs. Dombey, being from home, the maid awaited the result with solemn feelings. After much painful scrawling and erasing and putting in of wrong characters, which seemed to tumble out of the pencil of their own accord, the old woman produced this document. Rose-colored curtains. The maid, being perfectly transfixed and with tolerable reason, Cleopatra amended the manuscript by adding two words more when it stood time. Rose-colored curtains for doctors. The maid now perceived remotely that she wished these articles to be provided for the better presentation of her complexion to the faculty, and as those in the house who knew her best had no doubt of the correctness of this opinion, which she was soon able to establish for herself, the rose-colored curtains were added to her bed, and she mended with increased rapidity from that hour. She was soon able to sit up in curls and a laced cap and nightgown, and to have a little artificial bloom dropped into the hollow caverns of her cheeks. It was a tremendous sight to see this old woman in her finery leering and mincing at death, and playing off her youthful tricks upon him as if he had been the major. But, as an alteration in her mind that ensued on the paralytic stroke was fraught with as much matter for reflection, and was quite as ghastly. Whether the weakening of her intellect made her more cunning and false than before, or whether it confused her between what she had assumed to be and what she really had been, or whether it had awakened any glimmering of remorse, which could neither struggle into light nor get her back into total darkness, or whether, in the jumble of her faculties, a combination of these effects had been shaken up, which is perhaps the more likely supposition. The result was this, that she became hugely exacting in respect of Edith's affection and gratitude and attention to her highly laudatory of herself as a most inestimable parent and very jealous of having any rival in Edith's regard. Further, in place of remembering that compact made between them for an avoidance of the subject, she constantly alluded to her daughter's marriage as a proof of her being an incomparable mother, and all this with the weakness and peevishness of such a state, always serving for a sarcastic commentary on her levity and youthfulness. "'Where is Mrs. Dombey?' she would say to her maid. "'Gone out, ma'am.' "'Gone out? 
does she go out to shun her mamma flowers la bless you no ma'am mrs dombey has only gone out for a ride with miss florence miss florence who's miss florence don't tell me about miss florence what's miss florence to her compared to me the apposite display of the diamonds or the peach velvet bonnet she sat in the bonnet to receive visitors weeks before she could stir out of doors or the dressing up of her up in some god or other usually stopped the tears that began to flow hereabouts and she would remain in a complacent state until edith came to see her when at a glance of the proud face she would relapse again well i am sure edith she would cry shaking her head what is the matter mother matter i really don't know what is the matter the world is coming to such an artificial un and ungrateful state that i begin to think there's no heart or anything of that sort left in it positively withers is more of a child to me than you are he attends to me much more than my own daughter i almost wish i did not look so young and all that kind of thing and then perhaps i should be more considered what would you have mother oh a great deal edith impatiently is there anything you want that you have not it is your own fault if there be my own fault beginning to whimper the parent i have been to you edith making you a companion from your cradle and when you neglect me and have no more natural affection for me than if i were a stranger not a twentieth part of the affection that you have for florence but i am only your mother and should corrupt her in a day you reproach me with its being my own fault mother mother i approach you with nothing why will you always dwell on this isn't it natural that i should dwell on this when i am all affection and sensitiveness and i am wounded in the cruelest way whenever you look at me i do not mean to wound you mother have you no remembrance of what has been said between us let the past rest yes rest and let gratitude to me rest and let affection for me rest and let me rest in my out-of-the-way room with no society and no attention while you find new relations to make much of who have no earthly claim upon you good gracious edith do you know what an elegant establishment you are at the head of yes hush and that gentlemanly creature dombey do you know that you are married to him edith and that you have a settlement and a position and a carriage and i don't know what indeed i know it mother well as you would have had with that delightful good soul what did they call him granger if he hadn't died and who have you to thank for all this edith you mother you then put your arms round my neck and kiss me and show me edith that you know there was never a better mamma than i have been to you and don't let me become a perfect fright with teasing and wearing myself at your ingratitude or when i'm out again in society no soul will know me not even that hateful animal the major but sometimes when edith went nearer to her and bending down her stately head put her cold cheek to hers the mother would draw back as if she were afraid of her and would fall into a fit of trembling and cry out that there was a wandering in her wits and sometimes she would entreat her with humility to sit down on the chair beside her bed and would look at her as she sat there brooding with a face that even the rose-coloured curtains could not make otherwise than seared and wild 
the rose-coloured curtains blushed in course of time on cleopatra's bodily recovery and on her dress more juvenile than ever to repair the ravages of illness and on the rouge and on the teeth and on the curls and on the diamonds and the short sleeves and the whole wardrobe of the doll that had tumbled down before the mirror they blushed too now and then upon an indistinctness in her speech which she turned off with a girlish giggle and on an occasional failing in her memory that had no rule in it but came and went fantastically as if in mockery of her fantastic self but they never blushed upon a change in the new manner of her thought and speech towards her daughter and though that daughter often came within their influence they never blushed upon her loveliness irradiated by a smile or softened by the light of filial love in its stern beauty End of chapter thirty seven thirty eight of Dombey and Son. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Lyons. Dombey and Son by Charles Dickens. Chapter thirty eight. Miss Tox improves an old acquaintance. The forlorn Mr. Tox abandoned by her friend louisa chick and bereft of mr dombey's countenance for no delicate pair of wedding cards united by a silver thread graced the chimney-glass in princess's place or the harpsichord or any of those little posts of display which lucretia reserved for holiday occupation became depressed in her spirits and suffered much from melancholy for a time the bird waltz was unheard in princess's palace the plants were neglected and dust collected on the miniature of miss tox's ancestor with the powdered head and pigtail miss tox however was not of an age or of a disposition long to abandon herself to unavailing regrets only two notes of the harpsichord were dumb from disuse when the bird waltz again war warbled and trilled in the crooked drawing-room only one slip of geranium fell a victim to imperfect nursing before she was gardening at her green baskets again regularly every morning the powdered-headed ancestor had not been under a cloud for more than six weeks when Miss Tox breathed on his benignant visage and polished him up with a piece of wash leather. Still, Miss Tox was lonely and at a loss. Her attachments, however ludicrously shown, were real and strong, and she was, as she expressed it, deeply hurt by the unmerited contumely she had met with from Louisa. But there was no such thing as anger in Miss Tox's composition. If she had ambled on through life, in her soft-spoken way, without any opinions, she had, at least, got so far without any harsh passions. The mere sight of Louisa Chick in the street one day, at a considerable distance, so overpowered her milky nature that she was fain to seek immediate refuge in a pastry-cook's, and there, in a musty little back room usually devoted to the consumption of soups, and pervaded by an oxtail atmosphere, relieve her feelings by weeping plentifully. Against Mr. Dombey, Miss Tox hardly felt that she had any reason of complaint. Her sense of that gentleman's magnificence was such that once removed from him she felt as if her distance always had been immeasurable, 
and as if he had greatly condescended in tolerating her at all. No wife could be too handsome or too stately for him, according to Miss Tox's sincere opinion. It was perfectly natural that in looking for one he should look high. Miss Tox, with tears, laid down this proposition, and fully admitted it, twenty times a day. She never recalled the lofty manner in which Mr. Dombey had made her subservient to his convenience and caprices, and had graciously permitted her to be one of the nurses of his little son. She only thought, in her own words, that she had passed a great many happy hours in that house, which she must ever remember with gratification, and that she could never cease to regard Mr. Dombey as one of the most impressive and dignified of men. Cut off, however, from the implacable Louisa, and being shy of the Major, whom she viewed with some distrust now, Miss Tox found it very irksome to know nothing of what was going on in Mr. Dombey's establishment. And as she really had got into the habit of considering Dombey and Son as the pivot on which the world in general turned, she resolved, rather than be ignorant of intelligence which so strongly interested her, to cultivate her old acquaintance, Mrs. Richards, who, she knew, since her last memorable appearance before Mr. Dombey, was in the habit of sometimes holding communication with his servants. Perhaps Miss Tox, in seeking out the Tootle family, had the tender motive hidden in her breast of having somebody to whom she could talk about Mr. Dombey, no matter how humble that somebody might be. At all events, towards the Tootle habitation Miss Tox directed her steps one evening, what time Mr. Tootle, cindery and swart, was refreshing himself with tea in the bosom of his family. Mr. Tootle had only three stages of existence. He was either taking refreshment in the bosom just mentioned, or he was tearing through the country at from twenty-five to fifty miles an hour, or he was sleeping after his fatigues. He was always in a whirlwind or a calm, and a peaceable, contented, easy-going man, Mr. Tootle, was in either state, who seemed to have made over all his own inheritance of fuming and fretting to the engines with which he was connected, which panted and gasped and chafed and wore themselves out in a most unsparing manner, while Mr. Tootle led a mild and equable life. "'Polly, my gal,' said Mr. Tootle, with a young Tootle on each knee, and two more making tea for him, and plenty more scattered about. Mr. Tootle was never out of children, but always kept a good supply on hand. "'You ain't seen our biler lately, have you?' "'No,' replied Polly. "'But he's almost certain to look in to-night.' It's his right evening, and he's very regular. I suppose, said Mr. Tootle, relishing his meal infinitely, as our biler is a-doin' now about as well as a boy can do, eh, Polly? Oh, he's a-doing beautiful, responded Polly. He ain't got to be at all secret-like, has he, Polly? inquired Mr. Tootle. No, said Mrs. Tootle plumply. "'I'm glad he ain't got to be all secret like Polly,' observed Mr. Tootle in his slow and measured way, and, shoveling in his bread and butter with a clasp-knife, as if he were stoking himself, because that don't look well, do it, Polly. "'Why, of course it don't, Father. How can you ask?' "'You see, my boys and gals,' said Mr. Tootle, looking round upon his family, "'whatever—' You're up to in an honest way. It's my opinion as you can't do better than be open. If you find yourselves in cuttings or in tunnels, don't you play no secret games. Keep your whistles going and let's know where you are. 
the rising tootles set up a shrill murmur expressive of their resolution to profit by the paternal advice but what makes you say this along of rob father asked his wife anxiously polly old woman said mr tootle i don't know as i said it particular along o rob i'm sure it starts light with rob only i comes to a branch i takes on what i finds there and a whole train of ideas gets coupled on to him afore i know where i am or where they come from what a junction a man's thoughts is said mr tootle to be sure this profound reflection mr tootle washed down with a pint mug of tea and proceeded to solidify with a great weight of bread and butter charging his young daughters meanwhile to keep plenty of hot water in the pot as he was uncommon dry and should take the indefinite quantity of a sight of mugs before his thirst was appeased in satisfying himself however mr tootle was not regardless of the younger branches about him who although they had made their own evening repast were on the lookout for irregular morsels as possessing a relish these he distributed now and then to the excellent circle by holding out great wedges of bread and butter to be bitten at by the family in lawful succession and by serving out small doses of tea in like manner with a spoon which snacks had such a relish in the mouths of these young tootles that after partaking of the same they performed private dances of ecstasy among themselves and stood on one leg apiece and hopped and indulged in other salutary tokens of gladness these vents for their excitement found they gradually closed about mr tootle again and eyed him hard as he got through more bread and butter and tea affecting however to have no further expectations of their own in reference to those viands but to be conversing on foreign subjects and whispering confidentially mr tootle in the midst of this family group and setting an awful example to his children in the way of appetite was conveying the two young tootles on his knees to birmingham by special engine and was contemplating the rest over a barrier of bread and butter when rob the grinder in his suester hat and morning slops presented himself and was received with a general rush of brothers and sisters well mother said rob dutifully kissing her how are you mother there's my boy cried polly giving him a hug and a pat on the back secret bless you father not he this was intended for mr tootle's private edification but rob the grinder whose withers were not unwrung caught the words as they were spoken what father's been saying something more again me has he cried the injured innocent oh what a hard thing it is when a cove has once gone a little wrong a cove's own father should always be throwing it in his face behind his back it's enough cried rob resorting to his coat cuff in anguish of spirit to make a cove go and do something out of spite my poor boy cried polly father didn't mean anything if father didn't mean anything blubbered the injured grinder why did he go and say anything mother nobody thinks half so bad of me as my own father does what an unnatural thing i wish somebody'd take and chop my head off father wouldn't mind doing it i believe and i'd much rather he did that than the other at these desperate words all the young tootles shrieked a pathetic effect which the grinder improved by ironically adjuring them not to cry for him for they ought to hate him they ought if they was good boys and girls and this so touched the youngest tootle but one who was easily moved that it touched him not only in his spirit but in his wind too 
making him so purple that Mr. Tootle, in consternation, carried him out to the water-butt, and would have put him under the tap, but for his being recovered by the sight of that instrument. Matters having reached this point, Mr. Tootle explained, and the virtuous feelings of his son being thereby calmed, they shook hands, and harmony reigned again. "'Will you do as I do, Byler, my boy?' inquired his father, returning to his tea with new strength. "'No, thank you, father. Master and I had tea together.' "'And how is Master Rob?' said Polly. "'Well, I don't know, mother. Not much to boast on. There ain't no business done, you see. He don't know anything about it. The captain don't. There was a man come into the shop this very day, and says, I want a so-and-so. He says, some hard name or another. A witch, says the captain. A so-and-so, says the man. Brother, says the captain, will you take a observation round the shop? Well, says the man, I've done it. Do you see what you want? Says the captain. No, I don't, says the man. Do you know it when you do see it, says the captain? No, I don't, says the man. Why, then, I tell you what, my lad, says the captain, you had better go back and ask what it's like outside, for no more don't I. That ain't the way to make money, though, is it? said Polly. Money, mother, he'll never make money. He has such ways as I never see. He ain't a bad master, though. I'll say that for him. But that ain't much to me, for I don't think I shall stop with him long. "'Not stop in your place, Rob,' cried his mother, while Mr. Tootle opened his eyes. "'Not in that place, perhaps,' returned the grinder, with a wink. "'I shouldn't wonder. Friends at court, you know. But never you mind, mother. Just now I'm all right, that's all.' The indisputable proof afforded in these hints, and in the grinder's mysterious manner, of his not being subject to that failing which Mr. Tootle had, by implication, attributed to him, might have led to a renewal of his wrongs, and of the sensation in the family, but for the opportune arrival of another visitor, who, to Polly's great surprise, appeared at the door, smiling patronage and friendship on all there. "'How do you do, Mrs. Richards?' said Miss Tox. "'I have come to see you. May I come in?' The cheery face of Mrs. Richards shone with a hospitable reply, and Miss Tox, accepting the proffered chair, and gracefully recognizing Mr. Tootle on her way to it, untied her bonnet strings, and said that, in the first place, she must beg the dear children, one and all, to come and kiss her. The ill-starred youngest Tootle but one, who would appear from the frequency of his domestic troubles to have been born under an unlikely planet was prevented from performing his part in this general salutation by having fixed the suester hat with which he had been previously trifling deep on his head hind side before and being unable to get it off again which accident presented to his terrified imagination a dismal picture of his passing the rest of his days in darkness, and in hopeless seclusion from his friends and family, caused him to struggle with great violence and to utter suffocating cries. Being released, his face was discovered to be very hot and red and damp, and Miss Tox took him on her lap, much exhausted. "'You have almost forgotten me, sir, I dare say,' said Miss Tox to Mr. Tootle. "'No, ma'am, no,' said Tootle. "'But we've all on us got a little older since then.' "'And how do you find yourself, sir?' inquired Miss Tox blandly. "'Hardy, madam, thank ye,' replied Tootle. "'How do you find yourself, ma'am?' Do the rheumatics keep off pretty well, ma'am? We must all expect to grow into em as we gets on. 
"'Thank you,' said Miss Tox. "'I have not felt any inconvenience from that disorder yet.' "'You're very fortunate, ma'am,' returned Mr. Tootle. "'Many people at your time of life, ma'am, is martyrs to it. "'There was my mother.' "'But catching his wife's eye here, "'Mr. Tootle judiciously buried the rest in another mug of tea. "'You never mean to say, Mrs. Richards,' cried Miss Tox, looking at Rob, "'that that is your eldest, ma'am,' said Polly. "'Yes, indeed it is. "'That's the little fellow, ma'am, "'that was the innocent cause of so much.' "'This here, ma'am,' said Tootle, "'is him with the short legs, and they was,' "'said Mr. Tootle, with a touch of poetry in his tone, "'unusual short for leathers, "'as Mr. Dombey made a grinder on.' The recollection almost overpowered Miss Tox. The subject of it had a peculiar interest for her directly. She asked him to shake hands, and congratulated his mother on his frank, ingenuous face. Rob, overhearing her, called up a look to justify the eulogium, but it was hardly the right look. "'And now, Mrs. Richards,' said Miss Tox, and you too, sir, addressing Toodle, I'll tell you plainly and truly what I have come here for. You may be aware, Mrs. Richards, and possibly you may be aware, too, sir, that a little distance has interposed itself between me and some of my friends, and that where I used to visit a good deal, I do not visit now. Polly, who, with a woman's tact, understood this at once, expressed as much in a little look. Mr. Tootle, who had not the faintest idea of what Miss Tox was talking about, expressed that also in a stare. "'Of course,' said Miss Tox, "'how our little coolness has arisen is of no moment, and does not require to be discussed. It is sufficient for me to say that I have the greatest possible respect for and interest in Mr. Dombey.' Miss Tox's voice faltered, and everything that relates to him. Mr. Tootle, enlightened, shook his head and said he had heard it said. For his own part, he did think, as Mr. Dombey, was a difficult subject. "'Pray don't say so, sir, if you please,' returned Miss Tox. "'Let me entreat you not to say so, sir, either now or at any future time.' Such observations cannot but be very painful to me, and to a gentleman whose mind is constituted as, I am quite sure yours is, can afford no permanent satisfaction. Mr. Tootle, who had not entertained the least doubt of offering a, mar a remark that would be received with acquiescence, was greatly confounded. "'All that I wish to say, Mrs. Richards,' resumed Miss Tox, "'and I address myself to you too, sir, is this, "'that any intelligence of the proceedings of the family, "'of the welfare of the family, "'of the health of the family that reaches you, "'will be always most acceptable to me, "'that I shall be always very glad to chat with Mrs. Richards "'about the family and about old times.' and as Mrs. Richards and I never had the least difference, though I could wish now that we had been better acquainted, but I have no one but myself to blame for that. I hope she will not object to our being very good friends now, and to my coming backwards and forwards here, when I like, without being a stranger. Now I really hope, Mrs. Richards, said Miss Tox earnestly, that you will take this, as I mean it, like a good-humoured creature, as you always were. Polly was gratified and showed it. Mr. Tootle didn't know whether he was gratified or not, and preserved a stolid calmness. "'You see, Mrs. Richards,' said Miss Tox, "'and I hope you see too, sir. There are many little ways in which I can be slightly useful to you if you will make no stranger of me, 
and in which I shall be delighted to be so. For instance, I can teach your children something. I shall bring a few little books, if you'll allow me, and some work, and of an evening now and then they'll learn. Dear me, they'll learn a great deal, I trust, and be a credit to their teacher. Mr. Tootle, who had a great respect for learning, jerked his head approvingly at his wife, and moistened his hands with dawning satisfaction. Then, not being a stranger, I shall be in nobody's way, said Miss Tox, and everything will go on just as if I were not here. Mrs. Richards will do her mending or her ironing or her nursing, whatever it is, without minding me. And you'll smoke your pipe, too, if you're so disposed, sir, won't you? Thank you, Mum, said Mr. Tootle. Yes, I'll take my bit of backer. Very good of you to say so, sir, rejoined Miss Tox, and I really do assure you now, unfeignedly, that it will be a great comfort to me, and that whatever good I may be fortunate enough to do the children, you will be more than pay back to me, if you'll enter into this little bargain comfortably and easily and good-naturedly, without another word about it. The bargain was ratified on the spot, and Miss Tox found herself so much at home already that without delay she instituted a preliminary examination of the children all round, which Mr. Tootle much admired, and booked their ages' names and acquirements on a piece of paper. This ceremony and a little attendant gossip prolonged the time until after their usual hour of going to bed, and detained Miss Tox at the Tootle fireside until it was too late for her to walk home alone. The gallant grinder, however, being still there, politely offered to attend her to her own door, and, as it was something to Miss Tox to be seen home by a youth whom Mr. Dombey had first inducted into those manly garments which are rarely mentioned by name, she very readily accepted the proposal. After shaking hands with Mr. Tootle and Polly and kissing all the children, Miss Tox left the house, therefore, with unlimited popularity and carrying away with her so light a heart that it might have given Mrs. Chick offence if that good lady could have weighed it. Rob the Grinder, in his modesty, would have walked behind, but Miss Tox desired him to keep beside her for conversational purposes, and, as she afterwards expressed it to his mother, drew him out upon the road. He drew out so bright and clear and shining that Miss Tox was charmed with him. The more Miss Tox drew him out, the finer he came, like wire. There never was a better or more promising youth, a more affectionate, steady, prudent, sober, honest, meek, candid young man than Rob drew out that night. I am quite glad, said Miss Tox, arrived at her own door, to know you. I hope you'll consider me your friend, and that you'll come and see me as often as you like. Do you keep a money-box? Yes, ma'am, returned Rob. I'm saving up against I've got enough to put in the bank, ma'am. Very laudable indeed, said Miss Tox. I'm glad to hear it. Put this half-crown into it, if you please. Oh, thank you, ma'am, replied Rob. But really, I couldn't think of depriving you. I commend your independent spirit, said Miss Tox, but it's no deprivation, I assure you. I shall be offended if you don't take it as a mark of my good will. Good night, Robin. Good night, ma'am, said Rob, and thank you. Who ran sniggering off to get change, and tossed it away with a pie man? But they never taught honour at the grinder's school where the system that prevailed was particularly strong in the engendering of hypocrisy, insomuch that many of the friends and masters of past grinders said, if this were what came of education for the common people, let us have none. Some more rational said, let us have a better one. But the governing powers of the grinders' company were always ready for them, 
by picking out a few boys who had turned out well in spite of the system and roundly asserting that they could have only turned out well because of it which settled the business of those objectors out of hand and established the glory of the grinder's institution end of chapter thirty eight Chapter thirty nine of Dombey and Son. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Lyons. Dombey and Son by Charles Dickens. Chapter thirty nine. Further adventures of Captain Edward Cuttle, Mariner time sure of foot and strong of will had so pressed onward that the year enjoined by the old instrument maker as the term during which his friend should refrain from opening the sealed packet accompanying the letter he had left for him was now nearly expired and captain cuttle began to look at it of an evening with feelings of mystery and uneasiness the captain, in his honour, would as soon have thought of opening the parcel one hour before the expiration of the term as he would have thought of opening himself to study his own anatomy. He merely brought it out at a certain stage of his first evening pipe, laid it on the table, and sat gazing at the outside of it, through the smoke, in silent gravity, for two or three hours at a spell. Sometimes, when he had contemplated it thus, for a pretty long while, the captain would hitch his chair by degrees farther and farther off, as if to get beyond the range of its fascination. But, if this were his design, he never succeeded, for even when he was brought up by the parlour wall, the packet still attracted him, or if his eyes in thoughtful wandering rove to the ceiling or the fire its image immediately followed and posted itself conspicuously among the coals or took up an advantageous position on the whitewash in respect of heart's delight the captain's parental regard and admiration knew no change but since his last interview with Mr. Carker, Captain Cuttle had come to entertain doubts whether his former intervention in behalf of that young lady and her dear boy Walter had proved altogether so favourable as he could have wished, and as he at the time believed. The captain was troubled with a serious misgiving that he had done more harm than good, in short, and in his remorse and modesty he made the best atonement he could think of by putting himself out of the way of doing any harm to any one, and, as it were, throwing himself overboard for a dangerous person. Self-buried, therefore, among the instruments, the captain never went near Mr. Dombey's house or reported himself in any way to Florence or Miss Nipper, he even severed himself from Mr. Perch on the occasion of his next visit by dryly informing that gentleman that he thanked him for his company, but had cut himself adrift from all such acquaintance, as he didn't know what magazine he mightn't blow up without meaning of it. In this self-imposed retirement the captain passed whole days and weeks without interchanging a word with any one but Rob the Grinder whom he esteemed as a pattern of disinterested attachment and fidelity. In this retirement the captain, gazing at the packet of an evening, would sit smoking and thinking of Florence and poor Walter until they both seemed to his homely fancy to be dead, and to have passed away into eternal youth the beautiful and innocent children of his first remembrance. The captain did not, however, in his musings, neglect his own improvement, 
or the mental culture of Rob the Grinder. That young man was generally required to read out of some book to the captain for one hour every evening, and as the captain implicitly believed that all books were true, he accumulated by this means many remarkable facts. On Sunday nights the captain always read for himself before going to bed a certain divine sermon once delivered on a mount and although he was accustomed to quote the text without book after his own manner, he appeared to read it with as reverent an understanding of its heavenly spirit as if he had got it all by heart in Greek, and had been able to write any number of fierce theological disquisitions on its every phrase. Rob the Grinder, whose reverence for the inspired writings, under the admirable system of the grinder's school had been developed by a perpetual bruising of his intellectual shins against all the proper names of all the tribes of judah and by the monotonous repetition of hard verses especially by way of punishment and by the parading of him at six years old in leather breeches three times a sunday very high up in a very hot church with a great organ buzzing against his drowsy head like an exceedingly busy bee rob the grinder made a mighty show of being edified when the captain ceased to read and generally yawned and nodded while the reading was in progress the latter fact being never so much as suspected by the good captain captain cuttle also as a man of business took to keeping books in these he entered observations on the weather and on the currents of the wagons and other vehicles which he observed in that quarter to set westward in the morning and during the greater part of the day and eastward toward the evening two or three stragglers appearing in one week who spoke him so the captain entered it on the subject of spectacles and who, without positively purchasing, said they would look in again. The captain decided that the business was improving, and made an entry in the day-book to that effect. The wind then blowing, which he first recorded, pretty fresh, west and by north, having changed in the night. One of the captain's chief difficulties was Mr. Toots, who called frequently, and who— without saying much, seemed to have an idea that the little back parlour was an eligible room to chuckle in, as he would sit and avail himself of its accommodations in that regard by the half-hour together, without at all advancing in intimacy with the captain. The captain, rendered cautious by his late experience, was unable quite to satisfy his mind whether Mr. Toots was the mild subject he appeared to be, or was a profoundly artful and dissimulating hypocrite. His frequent reference to Miss Dombey was suspicious, but the captain had a secret kindness for Mr. Toots' apparent reliance on him, and forbore to decide against him for the present, merely eyeing him with a sagacity not to be described, whenever he approached the subject that was nearest to his heart. "'Captain Gills,' blurted out Mr. Toots, one day, all at once, as his manner was, "'do you think you could think favourably of that proposition of mine, and give me the pleasure of your acquaintance?' "'Why, I tell you what it is, my lad,' replied the captain, who had at length concluded on a course of action. I've been turning that there over. Captain Gills, it's very kind of you, retorted Mr. Toots. I'm much obliged to you. Upon my word and honour, Captain Gills, it would be a charity to give me the pleasure of your acquaintance. It really would. You see, brother, argued the captain slowly, I don't know you. "'But you never can know me, Captain Gills,' replied Mr. Toots, steadfast to his point, "'if you don't give me the pleasure of your acquaintance.' The captain seemed struck by the originality and power of this remark, 
and looked at Mr. Toots as if he thought there was a great deal more in him than he had expected. "'Well said, my lad,' observed the captain, nodding his head thoughtfully. "'And true. Now looky here. You've made some observations to me, which gives me to understand as you admire a certain sweet creature, hey? Eh? "'Captain Gills,' said Mr. Toots, gesticulating violently with the hand in which he held his hat, "'admiration is not the word. Upon my honour, you have no conception what my feelings are. If I could be dyed black and made Miss Dombey's slave, I should consider it a compliment. If, at the sacrifice of all my property, I could get transmigrated into Miss Dombey's dog, I, I really think I should never leave off wagging my tail. I should be so perfectly happy, Captain Gills.' Mr. Toots said it with watery eyes and pressed his hat against his bosom with deep emotion. "'My lad,' returned the captain, moved to compassion, "'if you're in earnest—' "'Captain Gills,' cried Mr. Toots, "'I'm in such a state of mind and am so dreadfully in earnest that if I could swear to it upon a hot piece of iron or a live coal, or melted lead, or burning sealing-wax, or anything of that sort, I should be glad to hurt myself as a relief to my feelings. And Mr. Toots looked hurriedly about the room, as if for some sufficiently painful means of accomplishing his dread purpose. The captain pushed his glazed hat back upon his head, stroked his face down with his heavy hand, making his nose more mottled in the process, and planting himself before Mr. Toots, and hooking him by the lapel of his coat, addressed him in these words, while Mr. Toots looked up into his face, with much attention and some wonder. "'If you're in earnest, you see, my lad,' said the captain, "'you're a object of clemency, and clemency is the brightest jewel in the crown of a Briton's head.' for which you'll overhaul the constitution as laid down in rule britannia and when found that is the charter as them garden angels was a singing of so many times over stand by this here proposal of yourn takes me a little aback and why because i holds my own only you understand in these here waters and haven't got no consort and maybe don't wish for none steady you hailed me first along of a certain young lady as you was chartered by now if you and me is to keep one another's company at all that there young creature's name must never be named nor referred to i don't know what harm mayn't have been done by naming of it too free afore now and thereby i brings up short do you make me out pretty clear, brother? Well, you'll excuse me, Captain Gills, replied Mr. Toots, if I don't quite follow you sometimes. But upon my word, I it's a hard thing, Captain Gills, not to be able to mention Miss Dombey. I really have got such a dreadful load here. Mr. Toots pathetically touched his shirt front with both hands, that I feel night and day exactly if as if somebody was sitting upon me. Them, said the captain, is the terms I offer. If they're hard upon you, brother, as mayhap they are, give em a wide berth, sheer off, and part company cheerily. Captain Gills, returned Mr. Toots, I hardly know how it is, but after what you told me when I came here for the first time, I, I feel that I'd rather think about Miss Dombey in your society than talk about her in almost anybody else's. Therefore, Captain Gills, if you give me the pleasure of your acquaintance, I shall be very happy to accept it on your own conditions. I wish to be honourable, Captain Gills, said Mr. Toots, holding back his extended hand for a moment, and therefore I am obliged to say that I cannot help thinking about Miss Dombey. It's impossible for me to make a promise not to think about her. My lad, said the captain, 
whose opinion of Mr. Toots was much improved by this candid avowal, a man's thoughts is like the winds, and nobody can't answer for em for certain any length of time together. Is it a treaty as to words? As to words, Captain Gills, returned Mr. Toots, I think I can bind myself. Mr. Toots gave Captain Cuddle his hand upon it, then and there and the captain, with a pleasant and gracious show of condescension, bestowed his acquaintance upon him formally. Mr. Toots seemed much relieved and gladdened by the acquisition, and chuckled rapturously during the remainder of his visit. The captain, for his part, was not ill-pleased to occupy that position of patronage, and was exceedingly well satisfied by his own prudence and foresight. But, rich as Captain Cuddle was in the latter quality, he received a surprise that same evening from no less ingenuous and simple youth than Rob the Grinder. That artless lad, drinking tea at the same table and bending meekly over his cup and saucer, having taken sidelong observations of his master for some time, who was reading the newspaper with great difficulty, but much dignity, through his glasses, broke silence by saying, "'Oh, I beg your car pardon, Captain, but you mayn't be in want of any pigeons, may you, sir?' "'No, my lad,' replied the Captain. "'Because I was wishing to dispose of mine, Captain,' said Rob. "'Ay, ay?' cried the captain, lifting up his bushy eyebrows a little. "'Yes, I'm going, Captain, if you please,' said Rob. "'Going? Where are you going?' asked the captain, looking round at him over the glasses. "'What? Didn't you know that I was going to leave you, Captain?' asked Rob, with a sneaking smile. The captain put down the paper, took off his spectacles, and brought his eyes to bear on the deserter. "'Oh, yes, Captain, I—' "'I'm going to give you warning. "'I thought you'd have known that beforehand, perhaps,' said Rob, "'rubbing his hands and getting up. "'If you could be so good as provide yourself soon, Captain, "'it would be a great convenience to me. "'You couldn't provide yourself by tomorrow morning, I am afraid, Captain, "'could you, do you think? "'And you're going to desert your colours, are you, my lad?' "'said the Captain, after a long examination of his face.' "'Oh, it's very hard upon a cove, Captain,' said the tender Rob, injured and indignant in a moment, "'that he can't give lawful warning without being frowned at in this way and called a deserter. "'You haven't any right to call a poor cove names, Captain. "'It ain't because I'm a servant and you're a master that you're to go and libel me. "'What wrong have I done? Come, Captain, let me know what my crime is, will you?' The stricken grinder wept, and put his coat-cuff in his eye. "'Come, Captain,' cried the injured youth, "'give my crime a name. What have I been and done? Have I stolen any of the property? Have I set the house afire? If I have, why don't you give me in charge and try it? But to take away the character of a lad that's been a good servant to you, because he can't afford to stand in his own light for your good, what a injury it is, and what a bad return for faithful service. This is the way young coves is spilled and drove wrong. I wonder at you, Captain, I do. All of which the grinder howled forth in a lachrymose whine, and backing carefully towards the door. "'And so you've got another berth, have you, my lad?' said the captain, eyeing him intently. "'Yes, captain, since you put it in that shape, I have got another berth,' cried Rob, backing more and more. "'A better berth than I've got here, and one where I don't so much as want your good word, captain, which is fortunate for me, after all the dirt you've thrown at me, because I'm poor and can't afford to stand in my own light for your good.' "'Yes, I have got another berth, and if wasn't for leaving you unprovided, Captain, I'd go to it now, sooner than I'd take them names from you, because I'm poor and can't afford to stand in my own light for your good.' 
why do you reproach me for being poor and not standing in my own light for your good captain how can you so demean yourself look ye here my boy replied the peaceful captain don't you pay out no more of them words well then don't you pay in no more of your words captain retorted the roused innocent getting louder in his whine and backing into the shop i'd sooner you took my blood than my character because pursued the captain calmly you have heard maybe of such a thing as a rope's end oh have i though captain cried the taunting grinder no i haven't i never heard of any such article well said the captain it's my belief as you'll know more about it pretty soon if you don't keep a bright lookout i can read your signals my lad you may go oh i may go at once may i captain cried rob exulting in his success but mind i never asked to go at once captain you are not to take away my character again because you send me off of your own accord and you are not to stop any of my wages captain his employer settled the last point by producing the tin canister and telling the grinder's money out in full upon the table rob snivelling and sobbing and grievously wounded in his feelings took up the pieces one by one with a sob and a snivel for each and tied them up separately in knots in his pocket handkerchief then he ascended to the roof of the house and filled his hat and pockets with pigeons then came down to his bed under the counter and made up his bundle snivelling and sobbing louder as if he were cut to the heart by old associations then he whined good night captain i leave you without malice and then going out upon the doorstep pulled the little midshipman's nose as a parting indignity and went away down the street grinning triumph the captain left to himself resumed his perusal of the news as if nothing unusual or unexpected had taken place and went reading on with the greatest assiduity but never a word did captain cuttle understand though he read a vast number for rob the grinder was scampering up one column and down another all through the newspaper it is doubtful whether the worthy captain had ever felt himself quite abandoned until now but now old sol gills walter and heart's delight were lost to him indeed and now mr carker deceived and jeered him cruelly they were all represented in the false rob to whom he had held forth many a time on the recollections that were warm within him he had believed in the false rob and had been glad to believe in him he had made a companion of him as the last of the old ship's company he had taken the command of the little midshipman with him at his right hand he had meant to do his duty by him and had felt almost as kindly towards the boy as if they had been shipwrecked and cast upon a desert place together and now that the false rob had brought distrust treachery and meanness into the very parlour which was a kind of sacred place captain cuttle felt as if the parlour might have gone down next and not surprised him much by its sinking or given him any very great concern therefore captain cuttle read the newspaper with profound attention and no comprehension and therefore captain cuttle said nothing whatever about rob to himself or admitted to himself that he was thinking about him or would recognize in the most distant manner that rob had anything to do with his feeling as lonely as robinson crusoe in the same composed business-like way the captain stepped over to leadenhall market in the dusk and affected an arrangement with a private watchman on duty there to come and put up and take down the shutters of the wooden midshipman every night and morning 
he then called in at the eating-house to diminish by one half the daily rations theretofore supplied to the midshipmen and at the public-house to stop the traitor's beer my young man said the captain in explanation to the young lady at the bar my young man having bettered himself miss lastly the captain resolved to take possession of the bed under the counter and to turn in there a nights instead of upstairs as the sole guardian of the property from this bed captain cuttle daily rose thenceforth and clapped on his glazed hat at six o'clock in the morning with the solitary air of crusoe finishing his toilet with his goatskin cap and although his fears of a visitation from the savage tribe mextinger were somewhat cooled as similar apprehensions on the part of that lone mariner used to be by the lapse of a long interval without any symptoms of the cannibals he still observed a regular routine of defensive operations and never encountered a bonnet without previous survey from his castle or retreat in the meantime during which he received no call from mr toots who wrote to say he was out of town his own voice began to have a strange sound in his ears and he acquired such habits of profound meditation from much polishing and stowing away of the stock and from much sitting behind the counter reading or looking out of the window that the red rim made on his forehead by the hard glazed hat sometimes arched again with excess of reflection the year being now expired captain cuttle deemed it expedient to open the packet but as he had always designed doing this in the presence of rob the grinder who had brought it to him and as he had an idea that it would be regular and shipshape to open it in the presence of somebody he was sadly put to it for want of a witness in this difficulty he hailed one day with unusual delight the announcement in the shipping intelligence of the arrival of the cautious clara captain john bunsby from a coasting voyage and to that philosopher immediately dispatched a letter by post enjoining inviolable secrecy as to his place of residence and requesting to be favoured with an early visit in the evening season bunsby who was one of those sages who act upon conviction took some days to get the conviction thoroughly into his mind that he had received a letter to this effect but when he had grappled with the fact and mastered it he promptly sent his boy with the message he's a coming to-night who being instructed to deliver those words and disappear fulfilled his mission like a tarry spirit charged with a mysterious warning the captain well pleased to receive it made preparation of pipes and rum and water and awaited his visitor in the back parlour at the hour of eight a deep lowing as of a nautical bull outside the shop door succeeded by the knocking of a stick on the panel announced to the listening ear of captain cuttle that bunsby was alongside whom he instantly admitted shaggy and loose and with his stolid mahogany visage as usual appearing to have no consciousness of anything before it but to be attentively observing something that was taking place in quite another part of the world bunsby said the captain grasping him by the hand what cheer my lad what cheer shipmet replied the voice within bunsby unaccompanied by any sign on the part of the commander himself hearty hearty bunsby said the captain rendering irre pressable homage to his genius here you are a man as can give an opinion as is brighter than diamonds and give me the lad with the tarry trousers as shines to me like diamonds bright 
for which you'll overhaul the Stanfell's budget and when found make a note. Here you are, a man as gave an opinion in this here very place that has come true every letter on it, which the captain sincerely believed. Aye, aye, growled Bunsby. Every letter, said the captain. For why, growled Bunsby, looking at his friend for the first time. Which way? If so, why not? Therefore, with these oracular words, they seemed almost to make the captain giddy. They launched him upon such a sea of speculation and conjecture. The sage submitted to be helped off with his pilot coat, and accompanied his friend into the back parlour, where his hand presently alighted on the rum-bottle, from which he brewed a stiff glass of grog, and presently afterwards on a pipe, which he filled, lighted, and began to smoke. Captain Cuttle, imitating his visitor in the matter of these particulars, though the rapt and imperturbable manner of the great commander was far above his powers, sat in the opposite corner of the fireside, observing him respectfully, and as if he waited for some encouragement or expression of curiosity on Bunsby's part which should lead him to his own affairs. But as the mahogany philosopher gave no evidence of being sentient or anything but warmth and tobacco, except once, when taking his pipe from his lips to make room for his glass, he incidentally remarked with exceeding gruffness that his name was Jack Bunsby, a declaration that presented but small opening for conversation, the captain bespeaking his attention in a short, complimentary exordium, narrated the whole history of Uncle Saul's departure with the change it had produced in his own life and fortunes, and concluded by placing the packet on the table. After a long pause, Mr. Bunsby nodded his head. "'Open?' said the captain. Bunsby nodded again. The captain accordingly broke the seal and disclosed to view two folded papers of which he severally read the endorsements, thus, Last Will and Testament of Solomon Gills, Letter for Ned Cuttle. Bunsby, with his eye on the coast of Greenland, seemed to listen for the contents. The captain therefore hemmed to clear his throat and read the letter out loud. My dear Ned Cuttle, when I left home for the West Indies, here the captain stopped and looked hard at Bunsby, who looked fixedly at the coast of Greenland. In forlorn search of intelligence of my dear boy, I knew that if you were acquainted with my design, you would thwart it or accompany me, and therefore I kept it secret. If you ever read this letter, Ned, I am likely to be dead. You will easily forgive an old friend's folly then, and will feel for the restlessness and uncertainty in which he wandered away on such a wild voyage. So no more of that. I have little hope that my poor boy will ever read these words or gladden your eyes with the sight of his frank face any more. No, no, no more said Captain Cuttle, sorrowfully meditating. No more. There he lays all his days. Mr. Bunsby, who had a musical ear, suddenly bellowed, In the bays of Biscay, oh, which so affected the good captain as an appropriate tribute to departed worth that he shook him by the hand in acknowledgment, and was fain to wipe his eyes. "'Well, well,' said the captain with a sigh, as the lament of Bunsby ceased to ring and vibrate in the skylight. Affliction sore, long time he bore, and let us overhaul the volume, and there find it. Physicians, observed Bunsby, was in vain. 
ay ay to be sure said the captain what's the good o them in two or three hundred fathoms of water then returning to the letter he read on but if he should be by when it is opened the captain involuntarily looked round and shook his head or should know of it at any other time the captain shook his head again my blessing on him in case the accompanying paper is not legally written it matters very little for there is no one interested but you and he and my plain wish is that if he is living he should have what little there may be and if as i fear otherwise that you should have it ned you will respect my wish i know god bless you for it and for all your friendliness besides to solomon gills bunsby said the captain appealing to him, to him solemnly what do you make of this there you sit a man as has had his head broke from infancy upwards and has got a new opinion into it at every seam as has been opened now what do you make of this if so be returned bunsby with unusual promptitude as he's dead my opinion is he won't come back no more if so be as he's alive my opinion is he will do i say he will no why not because the bearings of this observation lays in the application on it bunsby said captain cuttle who would seem to have estimated the value of his distinguished friend's opinions in proportion to the immensity of the difficulty he experienced in making anything out of them bunsby said the captain quite confounded by admiration you carry a weight of mind easy as would swamp one of my tonnage soon but in regard of this here will i don't mean to take no steps towards the property lord forbid except to keep it for a more rightful owner and i hope yet as the rightful owner saul gills is living and'll come back strange as it is that he ain't forwarded no dispatches now what is your opinion bunsby as to stowing of these here papers away again and marking outside as they was open such a day in the presence of john bunsby and edward cuttle bunsby descrying no objection on the coast of greenland or elsewhere to this proposal it was carried into execution and that great man bringing his eye into the present for a moment affixed his sign manual to the cover totally abstaining with characteristic modesty from the use of capital letters captain cuttle having attached his own left-handed signature and locked up the packet in the iron safe entreated his guest to mix another glass and smoke another pipe and doing the like himself fell amusing over the fire on the possible fortunes of the poor old instrument maker and now a surprise occurred so overwhelming and terrific that captain cuttle unsupported by the presence of bunsby must have sunk beneath it and been a lost man from that fatal hour how the captain even in the satisfaction of admitting such a guest could have only shut the door and not locked it of which negligence he was undoubtedly guilty is one of those questions that must for ever remain mere points of speculation or vague charges against destiny but by that unlocked door at this quiet moment did the fell mcstinger dash into the parlour bringing alexander mcstinger in her parental arms and confusion and vengeance not to mention juliana mcstinger and the sweet child's brother charles mcstinger popularly known about the scenes of his youthful sports as chowley in her train she came so swiftly and so silently like 
a rushing air from the neighbourhood of East India docks, that Captain Cuttle found himself in the very act of sitting looking at her before the calm face with which he had been meditating changed to one of horror and dismay. But the moment Captain Cuttle understood the full extent of his misfortune, self-preservation dictated an attempt at flight. Darting at the little door which opened from the parlour on the steep little range of cellar steps, the captain made a rush, head foremost, at the ladder like a man indifferent to bruises and contusions, who only sought to hide himself in the bowels of the earth. In this gallant effort he would probably have succeeded, but for the affectionate disposition of Juliana and Chowley, who, pinning him by the legs, one of those dear children holding on to each, claimed him as their friend with lamentable cries. In the meantime, Mrs. McStinger, who never entered upon any action of importance without previously inverting Alexander McStinger to bring him within the range of a brisk battery of slaps, and then sitting him down to cool as the reader first beheld him, performed that solemn rite as if on this occasion it were a sacrifice to the Furies, and having deposited the victim on the floor, made at the captain with a strength of purpose that appeared to threaten scratches to the interposing Bunsby. The cries of the two elder McStingers and the wailing of young Alexander, who may be said to have passed a piebald childhood forasmuch as he was black in the face during one half of that fairy period of existence, combined to make this visitation the more awful. But when silence reigned again, and the captain, in a violent perspiration, stood meekly looking at Mrs. McStinger, its terrors were at their height. "'Oh, Captain Cuddle, Captain Cuddle,' said Mrs. McStinger, making her chin rigid, and shaking it in unison with what, but for the weakness of her sex, might be described as her fist." Oh, Captain Cuddle, Captain Cuddle, do you dare to look me in the face and not be struck down in the hearth? The captain, who la looked anything but daring, feebly muttered, Stand by. Oh, I was a weak and trusting fool when I took you under my roof, Captain Cuddle, I was, cried Mrs. McStinger to think of the benefits I've showered on that man, and the way in which I brought my children up to love and honour him as if he was a father to him, when there ain't a housekeeper nor, nor, nor a lodger in our street don't know that I lost money by that man, and by his guzzlings and his muslings. Mrs. McStinger used the last word for the joint sake of alliteration and aggravation, rather than for the expression of any idea. And when they cried out one and all, shame upon him for putting upon an industrious woman, up early and late for the good of her young family, and keeping her poor place so clean that an individual might have ate his dinner, yes, and his tea too, if he was so disposed of, off any one of the floors or stairs, in spite of all his guzzlings and his muslings, such was the care and pains bestowed upon him. Mrs. McStinger stopped to f fetch her breath, and her face flushed with triumph in this second happy introduction of Captain Cuddle's muslings. "'And he runs away!' cried Mrs. McStinger, with a lengthening out of the last syllable that made the unfortunate captain regard himself as the meanest of men, and keeps away a twelve-month from a woman. Such is his conscience. He hasn't the courage to meet her high. Long syllable again, but steals away like a felion. Why, if that baby o' mine said Mrs. McStinger, with sudden rapidity, was to offer to go and steal away, I'd do my duty as a mother by him, till he was covered with whales. 
the young alexander interpreting this into a positive promise to be shortly redeemed tumbled over with fear and grief and lay upon the floor exhibiting the soles of his shoes and making such a deafening outcry that mrs mcstinger found it necessary to take him up in her arms where she quieted him ever and anon as he broke out again by a shake that seemed enough to loosen his teeth a pretty sort of man is cap'n cuddle said mrs mcstinger with a sharp stress on the first syllable of the captain's name to take on for and to lose sleep for and to faint along of and to think dead forsooth and to go up and down the blessed town like a madwoman asking questions after oh a pretty sort of man ha 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 he's worth all that trouble and distress of mind and much more that's nothing bless you ha 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 cap'n cuddle said mrs mcstinger with severe reaction in her voice and manner i wish to know if you're a coming home the frightened captain looked into his hat as if he saw nothing for it but to put it on and give himself up cap'n cuddle repeated mrs mcstinger in the same determined manner i wish to know if you're coming home sir the captain seemed quite ready to go but faintly suggested something to the effect of not making so much noise about it ay 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 said bunsby in a soothing voice awast my lass awast and who may you be if you please retorted mrs mcstinger with chaste loftiness did you ever lodge at number nine brig place sir my memory may be bad but not with me i think there was a mrs cholson lived at number nine before me and perhaps you're mistaking me for her that is my only way of accounting for your familiarity sir come come my lass awas awas said bunsby captain cuddle could hardly believe it even of this great man though he saw it done with his waking eyes but bunsby advancing boldly put his shaggy blue arm round mrs mcstinger and so softened her by his magic way of doing it and by these few words he said no more that she melted into tears after looking upon him for a few moments and observed that a child might conquer her now she was so low in her courage speechless and utterly amazed the captain saw him gradually persuade this inexorable woman into the shop return for rum and water and a candle take them to her and pacify her without appearing to utter one word presently he looked in with his pilot coat on and said cuddle i'm going to act as convoy home and captain cuddle more to his confusion than if he had been put in irons himself for safe transport to brig place saw the family pacifically filing off with mrs mcstinger at their head he had scarcely time to take down his canister and stealthily convey some money into the hands of juliana mcstinger his former favourite and chowley who had the claim upon him that he was naturally of a maritime build before the midshipman was abandoned by them all and bunsby whispering that he'd carry on smart and hail ned cuddle again before he went aboard shut the door upon himself as the last member of the party some uneasy ideas that he must be walking in his sleep or that he had been troubled with phantoms and not a family of flesh and blood beset the captain at first when he went back to the little parlour and found himself alone illimitable faith in and immeasurable admiration of the commander of the cautious clara succeeded and threw the captain into a wondering trance still as time wore on and bunsby failed to reappear the captain began to entertain uncomfortable doubts of another kind whether bunsby had been artfully decoyed to brig place 
and was there detained in safe custody as hostage for his friend, in which case it would become the captain, as a man of honour, to release him by the sacrifice of his own liberty. Whether he had been attacked and defeated by Mrs. McStinger, and was ashamed to show himself after his discomfiture. Whether Mrs. McStinger, thinking better of it, in the uncertainty of her temper, had turned back to board the midshipman again, and Bunsby, pretending to conduct her by a short cut, was endeavouring to lose the family amid the wilds and savage places of the city. Above all, what it would behoove him, Captain Cuttle, to do, in case of his hearing no more, either of the McStingers or of Bunsby, which, in these wonderful and unforeseen conjunctions of events, might possibly happen. He debated all this until he was tired, and still no Bunsby. He made up his bed under the counter, all ready for turning in, and still no Bunsby. At length, when the captain had given him up, for that night at least, and had begun to undress, the sound of approaching wheels was heard, and stopping at the door, was succeeded by Bunsby's hail. The captain trembled to think that Mrs. McStinger was not to be got rid of, and had been brought back in a coach. But no, Bunsby was accompanied by nothing but a large box, which he hauled into the shop with his own hands, and as soon as he had hauled in, sat upon Captain Cuttle, knew it for the chest he had left at Mrs. McStinger's house, and looking, candle in hand, at Bunsby more attentively, believed that he was three sheets in the wind, or, in plain words, drunk. It was difficult, however, to be sure of this, the commander having no trace of expression in his face when sober. Cuddle, said the commander, getting off the chest and opening the lid, are these here your traps? Captain Cuddle looked in and identified his property. Done pretty taut and trim, ship met, said Bunsby. The grateful and bewildered captain grasped him by the hand and was launching into a reply expressive of his astonished feelings when Bunsby disengaged himself by a jerk of his wrist and seemed to make an effort to wink with his revolving eye, the only effect of which attempt in his condition was nearly to overbalance him. He then abruptly opened the door and shot away to rejoin the cautious Clara with all speed supposed to be his invariable custom whenever he considered he had made a point. As it was not his humour to be often sought, Captain Cuddle decided not to go or send to him next day, or until he should make his gracious pleasure known in such wise, or failing that, until some little time should have elapsed. The captain, therefore, renewed his solitary life next morning and thought profoundly many mornings, noons, and nights of old Saul Gills, and Bunsby's sentiments concerning him, and the hopes there were of his return. Much of such thinking strengthened Captain Cuddle's hopes, and he humoured them and himself by watching for the instrument-maker at the door as he ventured to do now in his strange liberty and setting his chair in its place and arranging the little parlour as it used to be in case he should come home unexpectedly he likewise in his thoughtfulness took down a certain little miniature of walter as a schoolboy from its accustomed nail lest it should shock the old man on his return the captain had his presentiments too sometime that he would come on such a day, and one particular Sunday, even ordered a double allowance of dinner, he was so sanguine. But come, old Solomon did not, and still the neighbors noticed how the seafaring man in the glazed hat stood at the shop door of an evening, looking up and down the street. End of chapter 39